Thank you. Good morning. The flux is uh, decreasing. The neutrino <laughs> flux uh, is. OK. Uh, let's finish what we were seeing yesterday, uh, because uh, Professor Francesco Capozzi told me that he wanted to do something uh, similar, but uh, there were problems with network. And so uh, we were seeing what happens when uh, uh, the matter uh, potential is not constant along the neutrino path. So 1 over 4e minus delta m squared matter minus 4i e d theta m dx minus 4i e d theta m dx delta m squared matter a e e m a e mu m now imagine that uh, these are the neutrino components so we, when you have a generic state you express it as a superposition of flavor eigenstate and these are the components you can call it also new e and new mu typically but are not the fields and so these are related to the mass components by means of the u matrix now when uh, the matter profile is constant this uh, derivative is zero so you have a diagonal matrix a cont and so you have constant matter eigenstates but if this is not constant um, non-diagonal terms are related to oscillations between the two uh, mu and e neutrinos at the resonance you would have that this is equal to zero so the oscillation probabilities is maximal as we have seen yesterday in general if off diagonal terms are very small compared to the one on the diagonal the uh, mass eigenstate in matter the instantaneous mass eigenstate evolve ad adiabatically so they uh, it's like uh, uh, you divide the path in many steps and in each step you consider constant matter and so you diagonalize the uh, Hamiltonian and you find delta m squared matter and theta m the mixing angle in matter if you consider for instance uh, let's see the this is the the uh, electron density increasing toward the right and uh, you plot the mass eigenstates uh, squared let's put m 1 2 squared so that this delta m squared is the difference between these two typically you would find something like this let's say so sorry at higher density if you consider the formula that give uh, the mixing angle in matter as a function of the mixing angle in the um, vacuum I don't know like maybe I can rewrite we had uh, uh, okay where is this sine sorry sine 2 theta m equal to sine theta divided square root cos 2 theta minus a b 
divided delta m squared all squared plus sine squared to theta and you consider the cos to theta m is equal to the same square root but cos into the numerator cos minus acc delta m squared so this is equal to this one now when the density is very high the potential is very high so uh, you see this goes to zero and uh, here um, you get uh, uh, one or minus one depending on uh, the um, sign of a the potential and uh, uh, the delta m squared, this is positive, depending on the sign on the potential. So you have that the, the um, two, uh, cos theta to m goes to one, for instance. And so uh, theta m to pi divided by two. So if you consider the relation between the flavor and mass eigenstate, you will start, for instance, at higher density with new two. This is m2 squared in matter. And this is m1. m matter 1 squared. So if you have, for instance, in the uh, center of the sun, in the region, central region of the sun, high density, uh, neutrino, electron neutrino produced, this will be a new two in matter. Then, when the density decreases, it will stay on this uh, curve here. And when the density goes to zero, when the neutrino is approaching the surface of the sun, it, it will be still an instantaneous eigenstate or uh, mass eigenstate. But now, uh, with a vacuum, with a mixing angle different from the beginning, where it was pi over 2. In this case, the propagation is called adiabatic. When the two mass eigenstates are near, there is a probability of going from one to the other. This probability depends on, the, on this difference, on the exponential in this difference. And it is non-negligible only here okay now in the uh, actual case of solar neutrinos we know that uh, this is the case of adi adiabatic propagation adiabatic propagation means that uh, the ratio between non off diagonal and diagonal terms is much less than one and in particular if you put uh, the value for uh, the um, mass and uh, the mixing angle, this condition is, so if you define gamma as the ratio of these two, you will see that this is delta, uh, so uh, delta m squared divided for e d theta m dx, uh, much smaller than one. Okay, this is simply this ratio. And you can evaluate d theta m dx from these two relations. Uh, it is one over two sine two theta m delta m mass squared dacc over dx. So in the end, it depends on the mixing angle in matter and the squared mass difference in matter. And this change when neutrino goes. Uh, uh, and uh, on the profile. For instance, for the sun, this profile is nearly exponential.
exponentially going to zero. Okay. Uh, as, as I told you, only where the two states are near, the mass, instantaneous mass eigenvalues are near, there is a probability to make a jump. So that starting here, at a certain point, you can go down here. And uh, we will see, when we will dis briefly discuss supernova neutrinos, that there, this is for two generations, but this can be extended to three active neutrinos, and there, for supernova neutrino, when neutrino propagate uh, through the ejecta of the supernova, there are two possible uh, resonances. Resonances. Okay. Now, this was about varying matter density. Now, let's see today what is the status of all these uh, mixing parameters for neutrinos. But first of all, um, also, how can we study neutrinos? What are the sources that we have at uh, hand to study neutrinos? Um, as we have seen, in oscillation experiments, we uh, can probe the values of the squared mass differences, not the absolute values of neutrino mass. But for uh, model building, to try to understand how uh, neutrino masses enter the, into the a new theory extend, extending the standard model, it's important to understand the absolute neutrino masses. I'll make an example. We will see that uh, of the two square mass differences, one is uh, about a factor 100 smaller than the other. Okay, so there is a, a hierarchy in the neutrino mass spectrum. If, for instance, in the vacuum, you have, you can have the neutrino one and the neutrino two, this is, uh, let's say, delta m squared to one, and the third neutrino up here. And uh, for instance, this is delta m squared, three, two. Now, this is new three, okay? Just to have a feeling of the uh, order of magnitude, this is around uh, 2.4 uh, uh, times 10 to the minus 3, minus 3 EV squared, and this is 7.4 uh, times 10 to the minus 5 EV squared. Okay, so this is much smaller than this one. This is one possibility. So a doublet of uh, two uh, massive neutrino with a difference uh, squared uh, 10 to the minus five and one heavy uh, neutrino up here. This is called normal ordering. This is, this is one possibility. Normal just because it's the first choice, but it's not normal in the sense that the opposite is not a, a good one. We could have the two states, new two, new one here. By convention, we choose always the second uh, neutrino mass against state with mass uh, larger than the first one. Okay, so by convention, we always have delta m squared to one positive. But we could have a third neutrino, massive neutrino, new three, down here. And uh, oh, this is delta m squared to one. Now, this is delta m squared, one, three. Remember that delta m squared 
ij is mi squared minus mj squared. So if, if you consider delta m squared 3, 2, in this case, 3 is down here. So 3, 2 would be negative, OK? This is called inverted ordering. Hmm? This is also an information that we would like to have. The spectrum is like this or inverted. And this is important, as I told you, to those who try to build a model based on some new symmetry. Many models use uh, discrete symmetry group to try to uh, predict both masses and mixing angles. So in general, we would like to know the three mixing angles, theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3, theta 2, 3, the two squared mass differences. But uh, there are many, there are, this, this is one way to call the squared mass difference. But we always choose another way. So we call this doublet here, the square mass difference, the small delta m squared, because it's small with respect to the other, while we define this. So we take the mean value between m1 squared and m2 squared and define the large delta m squared as, in the case of normal ordering, m3 squared minus the half sum so this distance here if you consider the same thing here in inverted ordering you only need to take minus delta m squared so with this definition you distinguish the two cases only by changing this delta m squared into minus delta m squared. Instead, in the usual convention, you have to remember that the delta m squared 3, 2 is not equal to minus delta m squared 3, 2, uh, three, uh, two 3 in uh, inverted ordering. Because this is the, this difference. And in this case, minus would be this difference. It's larger. So it is not easy to compare normal and inverted ordering constraints if you use the IJ convention. Instead, with this definition, if you take the modulus of delta m squared, you are treating on the same foot both normal and inverted ordering. So typically, I will use delta as the large delta m squared and delta small, this one. And this can be positive or negative, OK? And positive is for normal ordering, and negative is for inverted ordering. So we have the two delta m squared. Let's put it here. Then we have the phase delta. This phase is connected to processes violating CP in neutrino physics. And then we want to know the ordering, the mass ordering. So oscillations are sensitive to these six parameters and to the mass ordering, the two possible spectra. There are other kind of experiments, as we will see, direct measurement of neutrino masses that are also sensitive to the values m1, m2, and m3. Okay, so while oscillations are only sensitive to mass differences, squared mass differences, there, there are uh, ex experiments sensitive to the absolute mass spectrum, in particular also uh, data from cosmology and astrophysics are sensitive 
actually, as we will see, cosmology is sensitive to the sum of neutrino masses. Okay. This is cosmology. Let, let's say cosmology and meaning also large scale structure surveys and so on. While we will see neutrino less double beta decay experiment and beta decay experiment are sensitive to, in principle, to the masses, but also this one to the two Majorana phases. The two Majorana phases do not enter in oscillation formulas. So oscillation experiment cannot tell anything about these two phases, but neutrino less double beta decay in principle could give us some information. Now, let's uh, see how we can have information on uh, this uh, neutrinos. So, uh, I don't know, maybe it's better that then we have a look directly to the plot, but imagine just to have uh, here, I plot uh, the neutrino flux in uh, units of, uh, so phi in EV to the minus one. So it actually is d phi, d phi in the E uh, centimeter to the minus two, second to the minus one. And uh, here, the neutrino energy. Put up here 10 to 18. And then down here, 10 to the minus 36. Okay, this is the range for the fluxes. So uh, more the, uh, I don't know, f for 54 order of magnitudes. Then the neutrino energy can be as low as 10 to the minus 6, let's say, electron volt, and 10 to 18. So it is impressive. Imagine. Uh, this is not the flux, but it's just uh, to, to put some. Uh, so we have here the uh, cosmic neutrino background, no? the relic neutrinos from the early universe. And uh, here we have very high energy neutrinos. For instance, the one that uh, Ice Cube measures or the cosmogenic neutrinos. And uh, uh, now I will try to put then the, the plot. Going from lower to higher energy, we will find here BBN, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis Neutrino, uh, then solar neutrino, then uh, geoneutrinos, uh, okay, there are also reactor neutrinos, so neutrino, neutrinos producing nuclear power plants. Obviously the total flux is irrelevant, but uh, if you are near the, the core, the flux is uh, the most intense one, just uh, with respect to energy. And then we will have the diffuse supernova neutrino background and a large range of atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, also here, supernova neutrinos. So the, let me write here. about the cosmic neutrino background, we know that we have 
for each flavor the uh, number density of neutrino plus antineutrinos is about uh, 112, uh, see, 112, 113 neutrinos for cubic centimeter. And uh, the uh, temperature, as you know, is about 1.9945 Kelvin. And uh, uh, the energy is milli electron volt. So the, um, these neutrinos, at least uh, two of them, are non relativistic today. Um, take, for instance, this case. Okay, we don't know. Oscillation measurement give us this small delta m square and the large delta m square with a precision of order percent. So we know these two differences, but we don't know where it is uh, the the lower state. M1 here, or M3. One possible choice, the lowest possible choice, is that the lowest state is massless. Hmm? So if this is zero, or this one is zero, but consider, for instance, here, you would have that M1, let's say, equal to zero, M2 is Okay, let's put uh, uh, roughly, because we know with percent accuracy, this would be square root of delta m squared. So this uh, value here, while m3 would be of the order of the square root of delta m squared. That is about 0.05 EV. Okay, this is the lowest possible case, because here this uh, M1 is zero. And we could do the same thing here. So also in this case, two of the relic neutrinos would be non-relativistic. Uh, for Big Bang nucleosynthesis neutrino, the energy is, ah, okay, the flux here is of the order of uh, uh, 10 to 10, 10 to 14, uh, EV minus one centimeter minus two, second minus one. Okay, so the highest possible. But unlikely is it, it is, <laughs> super challenging to measure, to detect this neutrino, because low energy, uh, they, they have negligible, negligible cross-section with <laughs> almost all that you can imagine. And uh, even if they give some small kick to a, a nucleus, to measure the kinetic energy of the nucleus would be extremely difficult. There are projects to me measure this uh, neutrinos, but maybe you will see, <laughs> uh, but I don't think that uh, I will be there, at least in this form, when we reborn <laughs> in some, uh, I will be a, a field student in law, for instance, because it is, okay, uh, here, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the, the flux is much smaller, okay, and the energy is around, sorry, uh, 10 to 100 milli electron volt. Okay, and this come uh, mostly from neutron decay and uh, uh, tritium, I believe, uh, reaction in the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Then we have solar neutrinos, and this is, these have been measured very well, 
So these are astrophysical neutrinos. Actually, one of the experiments that uh, measured solar neutrinos, Super Kamiokande, has a kind of plot uh, where from the zenith angle of neutrinos, you can see the sun. So we have seen actually the sun also in neutrinos. And uh, the energy of solar neutrino is of the order of uh, MeV. So energy is 0.1 to, let's say, 10, 20 MeV. Hmm? So here we, have, we are at MeV. Also, supernova neutrinos are in the range of MeV. Actually, we can consider the flux of all supernova exploded in the past. They are circulating around, and we have uh, about, uh, okay, the flux is 10 to the minus 1, so much smaller than uh, the relic neutrinos. And uh, uh, typically, one supernova about every two seconds explodes in the observable universe. So this is a flux that next generation of experiments is expected to measure, diffuse supernova background. While for observation of a supernova in neutrinos, as you know, in 1987, uh, uh, 20 events were recorded, recorded when the uh, supernova one, 1987 exploded. And uh, now we expect thousands of events in new experiments if a galactic supernova explode, will explode. We believe that uh, two or three supernova per century uh, explode in our galaxy. So you will be there when the supernova will explode and this will be a great uh, of great importance because from supernova we could learn a lot about neutrinos but also neutrinos could give us a lot of information about the explo explosion mechanism of a supernova. Uh, then we have geoneutrinos G neutrinos uh, as like, are like a reactor neutrinos. Uh, reactor and G neutrinos have energy, let's say, 0, uh, 10 MeV. Hmm? And uh, G neutrinos are produced by uh, uranium. Uh, thorium and potassium, radioactive uh, elements uh, in the earth, in the, in the crust, and uh, have been measured. Uh, they have energy in uh, zero, two or three MeV energy range. Reactor neutrino also are used in experiments. And we will see how through the measurement of reactor neutrino, we, we the experimentalists, <laughs> measured theta-1,3. Hmm? Then uh, also we have somewhere here accelerator neutrinos. Obviously, the flux, the total flux of accelerator neutrinos is negligible, but exper the energy few GeV, hmm? um, the energy of this neutrino is few GeV, they, they come from uh, pions, kaons, decay, and uh, they are important because through these experiments uh, we have information on the phase delta, for instance. Okay, so flux is negligible, but experiments designed to measure these neutrinos are very important. Then we have atmospheric neutrinos. Atmospheric neutrinos come from the 
cosmic ray interaction with nuclei in the atmosphere. And uh, uh, this interaction produce uh, uh, pions that decay in muons. Pions and muons decay in neutrinos. And uh, the energy, the, the, um, uh, the flux uh, um, as, um, behaves more or less like the primary cosmic ray flux. And uh, um, energy goes from, uh, let's say, uh, hundreds of MeV to 10 to 3, 4 GeV. Then we have these very high cosmic rays that come from very high, uh, very high energy neutrinos that come from very high energy cosmic rays, and in this case they are called cosmogenic, uh, or from uh, decays of a particle produced in uh, active uh, galactic nuclei, these extreme sources of very high energy. Okay, uh, I will, when we start the next hour, I will uh, show these uh, guns. It's not guns and roses, but it's grand unified neutrino source. Okay, and uh, it is impressive how many order of magnitudes you have in energy and in flux. Okay. Now, this huge energy range means that you need completely different experimental techniques to detect these neutrinos. Because any different energy range means different cross-section that are relevant to detect this neutrino, and also detection technique completely different. So, the uh, community of uh, neutrino experimentalists is uh, so many, um, okay, has a lot of, uh, um, how to say, must be extremely, uh, oh, I don't know, people expert in accelerator physics or in bolometers or in Cherenkov detector and so on. So there are, there are a lot of experimental techniques. Now, um, through all this neutrino, we want to have informations about this six dimensional parameter space plus the mass ordering and also uh, in combination with uh, other experiments about the absolute neutrino masses and the Majorana phases. This is our program. Now, 20, uh, let's say 30 years ago, there was still a doubt if oscillation were uh, through phenomenon or not. While today, we have a good measurement of all uh, the para oscillation parameter, possibly with the exception of delta. Um, and uh, uh, obviously the, the sign of the delta m squared, so the, the mass ordering. And uh, some doubts about the octant of theta to three. Um, these parameters are usually named this way. Okay, we call these solar parameters because solar neutrino experiment were important to measure this uh, couple of parameters. And uh, we call this as the atmospheric parameters. And uh, both atmospheric and solar neutrino experiment were also sensitive, but to, uh, with lower sensitivity to this theta-1-3 angle that we call also reactor angle. Because reactor neutrino experiment gave us a very precise measurement of this theta-1-3, okay? So 
when you, you hear solar neutrino parameters is theta 1, 2 and the small delta m squared. Atmospheric neutrino parameters, theta 2, 3, delta m squared. If you think back to the oscillation uh, formula, it is clear that the sensitive to a delta m squared, large or, or small, depends on the path length of neutrino uh, detected in a given experiment and on the energy. So you need to know this combination to see if this uh, class of experiment is sensitive to the uh, delta m square, uh, small or large. Now, we, divide, we can, let's say, make another global plot. We here can write the experiment class atmospheric, solar, reactor, short baseline means that you detect neutrinos at a small distance, let's say less than one kilometers. So you risk your life and you are very near a power plant. Then we have long baseline uh, experiment, like for instance, accelerator long baseline experiment. Uh, future medium baseline experiment, uh, I will tell you what this is. And uh, let's say supernova neutrinos when a supernova will uh, explode. And uh, Let's put here the parameters, so delta m squared, the large delta m squared, theta 2, 3, theta 1, 3, theta 1, 2, small delta m squared, delta, and the mass ordering, okay? Now, atmospheric neutrino experiments are sensitive, mainly sensitive, to the large delta m square, theta 2, 3, and less to theta 1, 3, but they, they depend on theta 1, 3, and also weakly, very weakly, they depend on theta 1, 2, and del the solar delta m squared. But they are not able to measure. But the oscillation probability that you should use if you want to uh, analyze the atmospheric neutrino data depends on the solar parameters. They have some uh, also dependence on delta. So they are able to say something on delta and also sensitive to the mass ordering, okay? Solar neutrino experiment, as I said, depends on these two parameters, the solar parameters. So theta 1, 2, delta squared, the small. So when I was young, uh, we studied atmospheric neutrinos, for instance, in a two generation approximation. And so these two parameters were the only parameters, but we started to, to use also theta 1, 3, so something beyond the two neutrino approximation. Also, you can study solar neutrinos in the two neutrino generation approximation, and the solution is quite good, the solution to the solar pro, uh, neutrino deficit, but today we know that this angle is not zero, so you need a full three generation description of the experiment, so you have also sensitivity to theta 1, 3, and uh, they weakly depend also on the large delta m square, but they are not sensitive solar neutrino to this delta m square, but, uh, and uh, no delta, they are not sensitive to delta, and uh, no sensitivity to the mass ordering. Okay, maybe I should stop there. 
and uh, we we start again. Yes. Okay, uh, as promised, this is the guns, so the uh, grand unified neutrino spectrum, okay? And uh, uh, every time I see this uh, picture, uh, for me it's impressive, okay? But uh, as always happens in life, where the flux is high is too much difficult to measure for the cosmic neutrino background. And uh, now we can have some hope to detect these very high energy neutrinos with ice cube, but the flux is low. And uh, okay. Now let's go back to the, this classification of experiments. Reactor short baseline. Short means with respect to the size of the Earth, one kilometers. In principle, you know that uh, how the spectrum of uh, neutrinos that are produced in all uh, the chain uh, in nuclear fusion reaction in a reactor core. In principle. There are hundreds of reactions that you need to compute. You have this spectrum. You put a, a detector at what kilometers and a kilometer distance, and you measure the total flux. If uh, uh, the flux is not what you expect, you can be sensitive to the, this mixing angle, theta 1, 3, and to the large delta m squared and uh, uh, no uh, but you are not sensitive to other parameters mm, for instance uh, uh, about 10 years ago an a dia bay with not just one detector but many detectors so you have you don't need the absolute value of the flux, but you can make ratios, was able finally to measure these angles because this was the less known of the mixing angles. And if theta 1, 3 was zero, were zero, in the case of zero theta 1, 3, you have no three generation effects in atmospheric or solar neutrinos. And uh, uh, some times ago, it was uh, uh, experimentalists were projecting um, neutrino factory to measure theta one three of order ten to the minus, minus four and so on. Now we know that sine squared of theta uh, one three is point oh two about, so small but not zero. Then. This uh, future medium, uh, this is not uh, baseball, but uh, uh, medium baseline means you have, uh, you in China, they have a lot of uh, nuclear power plants and they build, they are building a huge detector at uh, around about 50 kilometers and uh, even if they are very far for this, from these 10 power plants, uh, reactor cores, sorry, they will be able to measure with sub percent precision the delta m square, the other delta m square, theta 1, 2. Theta 1, 3, not so, more or less with the precision of the uh, previous experiments. And uh, most importantly, they will be 
sensitive to the mass ordering effect. And uh, uh, actually, the, the, the main goal of uh, this Juno experiment is to measure mass ordering. In, uh, let's say, five years, they will have a three, four sigma sensitivity to the mass ordering. Then we have accelerator, long baseline accelerator experiments. Uh, long, long means hundreds kilometers, 100 kilometers, for instance. They are sensitive to the large delta m square, to theta to three, to the mass ordering, to delta, theta one three. But they need as an input theta one two and the, so the solar parameters. Not able to measure the solar parameters, but the oscillation probability depends in a sub-leading way from the uh, parameters. Supernova neutrino, in principle, could be in sensitive to the two delta m square and uh, theta one three, theta one two, also to the mass ordering, okay? I say in principle, we will see why. Now, I have a plot with colors, so much more uh, interesting. But you see that if you want to know all the parameters, you need to combine the experiments because no, there is no class of experiments able to, measures all para to measure all parameters. Only a combination of experiments can give you information. And so, as I said before, different experimental <coughs> techniques, different energy range. Moreover, some experiment is a disappearance experiment. So you, in principle, know the new mu flux, you measure the new mu flux, and you see how many uh, new mu's are oscillating in new taus or new e. For instance, long baseline experiment are also appearance experiment. They prepare a beam of new mu and try to measure new e. Okay, uh, so they are sensitive to delta. Um, and so on. So we have both appearance and disappearance experiments. Now, uh, we don't have time to go to, to all experiments, but I want just to discuss what is the, what, what is the current status of uh, these parameters. Let's see here. So, in principle, when you combine different experiments, you, sh you should also take into account correlations between different experiments. This is nearly impossible. But if you take a class of experiment there, you can do something to take into account correlations between, for instance, solar experiments or reactor, neutrino experiments, and so on. Now, typically, the uh, result of the analysis can be shown in uh, plots like this. So, when you do a statistical analysis, you construct a chi-square. Uh, uh, for instance, you have n observables. No, you construct your chi-square, and uh, uh, first you see if your minimum chi-square, the chi-square will depend on the oscillation parameters, you see if the chi-square is order of n, there your fit is good. So first you check the goodness of fit. You need to have a minimum for, for the chi-square of the order of the number of, obser of, of observables. Okay, once you see that your fit is good, also by eye, you plot your data, you plot the fit, okay, this is good. If it is good, the chi-square would be order n. Then you take the minimum 
and you uh, plot, uh, you identify a region where the delta chi square it is equal to some numbers. We adopt the convention to consider, for instance, imagine you have two parameters. Hmm? I don't know, the theta 1, 2, for instance, sine square theta 1, 2, and delta m square for the solar analysis. Okay. Uh, actually, <laughs> we always do the opposite. Hmm? Theta 1, 2. So, for instance, your minimum is here. Then you have uh, some region uh, where the delta k square is equal, for instance, we plot 1, 4, and 9. Why? Because if you make the projection, let's say this is, for instance, uh, delta k square equal to 4. If you make the projection, you will have the best fit value and the two sigma region allowed for delta m squared. If you make the projection here, you will have the best fit value for theta 1, 2 and the two sigma allowed region. But uh, you will find that the literature 19% confidence level in two degrees of freedom where this value is 4.61. Okay, or uh, the 95% confident, uh, confidence limit, so on. So we use this three value of delta chi square so to easily identify the one, two, and three sigma region for the parameter. Now, if you plot the chi square, the delta chi square, if uh, your theory is a good theory and errors are more or less Gaussian, you will find a parabola. Hmm? The minimum is zero because we are plotting delta chi square. But uh, once you do this, you can also consider the square root of delta chi square. This will give you two straight lines. So usually we plot straight lines hmm, to, uh, and if they are straight, so we plot the square root of delta k square. If there is no strange thing happening, you will have two straight lines. Now, uh, if we consider the um, uh, mixing angle and, uh, for instance, the two delta m square, let's say delta m square solar, delta m square, uh, atmospheric, the delta in units of pi. Remember that delta is in the zero to pi region uh, interval. Then the mixing angle, sine square theta one two, sine square theta, uh, let's say one three, sine square theta two three. Okay, we have straight lines for the two delta m square. This means that we uh, have a good fit for this, uh, uh, let's say here you can put one, two, three. So this is the one sigma region, two sigma region, three sigma region, etc. Now, uh, for the delta solar delta m square, where is, okay, here, we have 2.3% error. So one sigma error in the, on the solar parameters is 2.3%, so very good. For the uh, atmospheric um, delta m squared, let's say the modulus, because we want to see the value of delta m squared, but still we don't know the uh, mass ordering. The precision is 1.1%. One, 1 In principle, this number change if you assume normal ordering or inverted ordering, but that, uh, does not change much. 
So this is the best known parameters, and its measure comes from comes from reactor, short baseline experiment, long baseline experiment, and atmospheric experiment. This was the first one. But uh, the reactor neutrino experiment now uh, gave uh, give a, a much, not much better, but a better measurement. Uh, and this, the accelerator, long baseline accelerator neutrino, give a competitive measurement of delta m square. So all in all, 1.1%. Then let's go to the solar neutrinos, solar neutrino angles. This is good also. And the precision is 4.5%. So good, but not so, not extremely good. Uh, theta 1, 3 is, uh, where is the bird? 3%. Okay, no, it, it is important to have the accuracy, but also the central value. Okay, this is uh, 7. Okay, I, I don't write the value, I tell you, but is on the table in the note. For the solar delta m squared, is 7.36 uh, electron volt squared. So uh, times 10 to the minus 5. So 7.3 times 10 to the minus 5. This is 2.45, uh, about, times 10 to the minus 3 electron volt square. So a factor 100, less than one, a bit less than 100. This is point, the sine squared 0.30, uh, Point, uh, point, point 0.3, hmm? while this is much smaller, is uh, uh, 0.02. This is 0.3. This is 0.02, the sine squared. Of, uh, so this is about 7 degrees. And uh, this is, uh, I don't remember the name, but uh, the, the, the angle is uh, 30 degrees, I don't know. So this is small, and so precision is much difficult to achieve for a small value. And, uh, but also here, if you plot the square root of delta chi square, you get to straight, a straight line. Now, some problem here and here. Because for the theta 2, 3, we know that is roughly maximal, so pi over 4. But actually, we don't know if it is maximal or the minimum is here or here. The last, uh, last plot was something like this. So you have two minima. The best fit is for theta to 3 slightly smaller than pi over 4. And uh, the other minimum is at, uh, uh, let's say this is two sigma, is allowed at two sigma, okay? And uh, over the years, this changes. Sometimes you get the best fit in the second octant. Maybe the latest, latest uh, release of data favors this one over this one. So. We say that the determination of the octant of theta 2, 3 is not still robust. Actually, we know that this angle, this mixing angle is large. Large means around pi over 4, but we don't know the octant. If you consider instead the uh, delta, okay, you get something like this. So, uh, the combination of all data favors, prefers this minimum here is, uh, is between 1 and 1.5, okay? Now, 
if delta is equal to pi, sine delta is equal to zero, there is no CP violation. If uh, delta is equal to three pi over two, the uh, delta, the um, sine is uh, minus one, and uh, uh, CP violation is maximal. So actually, to know where it is, it is important, but still, we have no clear indication in favor of CP violation. The problem is that there are two experiments here. One is T2K in Japan, uh, and the other is NOVA in, uh, in the United States, that are not in so much in agreement. And so there is a tension between these two experiments and while a few years ago, three pi over two was favored, now this uh, is uncertain, okay? Now, I, I, I shown here only one curve. This is, for instance, for normal ordering or for inverted ordering. What if I show both normal and inverted ordering? Okay. I have to check what ordering gives me the best fit, and uh, today the best fit is for normal ordering, while for inverted ordering there is a delta chi square about 6.5. So present global analysis prefer normal ordering, and uh, at the level between two three sigma with respect to inverter ordering. You can plot also here the corresponding curves for inverted ordering. And you can choose if you want to show the difference. For instance, I don't know, uh, you can have some plot like this. This means this is the this should be square root of 6.5. This tells you that normal ordering is best, better than inverted ordering. This is the square root of the difference in chi-square of the minima. And for instance, the octant can also flip, going from one order to the other. So uh, with respect to theta to three and delta, things are still not so clear. While the two delta m square, the atmospheric and the solar mixing angle, and also the reactor angle, theta 1, 3, we can say they are very well known. Okay. Uh, actually, I can show you. We have discussed of this plot. <laughs> no, this is not true. This is the present global analysis. You see, good, okay, when you show the other ordering, you don't get straight lines, but this is just uh, something related to the plots. But this is the difference. You see that normal ordering at 2.5 sigma, sigma is better than inverted ordering. Uh, these four parameters are, are well known, while here, you have still some uh, doubt about the um, octant. And you see, if inverter order were, was, were the correct one, the preferred value for delta is 3 pi over 2, so maximal CP violation. While in normal ordering, OK, you are in between 1, so delta equal to pi, no CP violation. Delta equal to zero or pi is no CP violation. Delta equal to pi over two, so 0.5 or 1.5, there is maximal CP violation, okay? This is what you get if you consider all the parameter space and you marginalize, you want to know the bounds on theta one three, you marginalize over all the other parameters. But you can also consider 
correlations between parameters, okay? And combining different experiments, okay? And, uh, but this is, we don't have the time to discuss this. Well, this plot is the plot that shows the uh, disagreement, let's say, or the tension between the T2K and NOVA experiments. T2K and NOVA both measure neutrinos and antineutrinos. They produce, through magnets, a flux of new mu or anti-new mu. And in the far detector, uh, actually the distance in NOVA is larger than in T2K, uh, in the far detector, NOVA maybe 750 kilometers, if I, something like this, they reveal the new mu and the new E. So both have disappearance and appearance. If you plot the new expected rate and the measured value or anti-new mu in various combinations, and uh, uh, blue is for normal ordering, then red inverter ordering, and uh, this uh, star or circle corresponds to some value for delta. Okay, we don't have time to, to see actually uh, in detail this plot, but if you have 10 minutes and reflect, you see that you have some uh, incompa incompatible uh, indication from the two experiments. So when you combine two things that are not in agreement, you always get a minimum in the chi-square. But this solution is not so good, okay? So even if, even if when we combine the two experiments, we get some minimum for, for, from, for delta, there is tension in the two, uh, between the two experiments. And this reflects in the fact that still we don't know delta very well. And uh, they are now upgrading their apparatus, uh, their apparatus, and uh, probably in the next few years we will have some stable, more stable information on delta, but as you see from this table here, you see and you don't see actually, if you improve your knowledge on some parameters, indirectly you improve the knowledge on other parameters. Because, for instance, long baseline oscillation probability depends on the delta m squared, theta 2, 3, and uh, on, the, on delta. By improving the measurement of the other parameters, as for instance Juno will do in the next 10 years, you will indirectly improve your bounds on delta and on the mass ordering. So there are a lot of correlations between these uh, uh, observables in the six-dimensional parameter space. Six-dimensional times two, because you have normal and inverted ordering. Okay, now uh, this is for oscillation, okay? What about the absolute neutrino masses? There are uh, another two classes of experiments. There is the um, so direct. What do you call measurements? We have two classes of experiments that are sensitive to M1, M2, and M3. Now, first of all, since uh, we know with a percent accuracy the two delta M squared, hmm, for instance, assume normal ordering. Hmm, so. This is the small delta m square. This is the large 
delta m squared. Uh, actually, if you know, in this case, m1, you know that m2 is m1 plus uh, the, let's say, okay, let's say m2 squared, this is better, is m1 squared plus delta m squared, okay? So m2 is the square root of this, okay? And m3 <laughs> squared, hmm, this one, will be m1 squared plus delta m squared, the small delta m squared divided by 2 plus the large delta m squared. So, with percent accuracy, if you propagate the errors, if we know the smallest one, the, 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 the lightest neutrino mass, we know more or less all the other neutrino mass. So, we can do the analysis of these experiments that directly are sensitive to the neutrino mass spectrum by taking into account the information coming from oscillation experiments. Instead of having three unknowns, the three masses, we have one unknown, and we should take into account the errors on the two delta m squared. Okay? Now, what are these, these experiments? Are the neutrinoless zero nu double beta decay. Sign times one puts the double beta. Okay. So in this case, uh, uh, there, are, there is um, inside some, some nucleus, uh, two neutron decay. Now, neutron decay, neutron goes into a proton, electron, and uh, uh, anti-neutrino. Okay. But if neutrino is a Majorana particle, okay, it can also happen that this decay um, produce no neutrino in the final state. So zero neutrino, double beta decay. Two neutrons inside the nucleus decaying into protons. So Z of the nucleus, nucleus is increased by two units and two electrons are emitted. And uh, these uh, experiments are sensitive to, to one effective parameters that we call m beta beta, that is c13 squared, c12 squared, m1 squared plus c13 squared, sine 12 squared, m2 squared plus sine 13 squared, m3 squared, sorry, <laughs> I, um, I, I took the m beta parameter. Okay, I leave it here for beta decay, so I will save time. <laughs> and this is square root of, while for neutrinoless double beta decay, I have m beta beta, that is equal to modulus of so sine squared cos sine squared. Okay, and the, here sine, uh, cosine squared one three, cosine squared one two, m one plus c squared one three, s squared one two, m two, e to the i phi 2 plus sine squared 1 3 m 3 e to the i phi 2. Okay, so I, I was talking about neutrino as double beta decay. If neutrinos are Majoran, because if two neutrons go into two protons, <laughs> Uh, and uh, plus electrons, you have violation of lepton numbers if you don't have neutrinos, okay? So 
this decay is only possible for new Majorana neutrinos. This is the reason why this effective parameter is sensitive to the Majorana phases. So this is a complex number that you take the modulus and depends on the absolute masses. But as I told you, we can also use here the information coming from oscillation experiments. Uh, sorry, do you, do you hear well? Because I see my voice going. Um, so, sorry. Sorry. this formula in the end will depend on one massive state, for instance, M1, and we could, could use the information on the two delta M squared. Obviously, there can be some cancellation here because this is a complex number. So these two numbers can cancel each other. And if M1 is zero, if you use the best fit parameters, you see that there, ca there could be, for norm normal ordering, a complete cancellation. So this could be also very, very small, in principle equal to zero for normal ordering. Instead, if you take inverted ordering, since you have, if you properly put the numbers, you see that you can never obtain that this is equal to zero for inverted ordering. So when experimentalists try to measure if this decay is happening or not, if nature uh, prefer or the true ordering is inverted one, this could be, this could uh, make the measure much more easier because in normal ordering this could go to zero. Okay. And so this is for uh, neutrino S double beta decay. Then there is another class of experiment, essentially the most precise experiment currently running is Katrin. So uh, uh, experiments is unlucky because they can uh, always choose some good names for their experiment. It's much more difficult for you theorists to choose a, a, a good name for a theory. The Catherine theory of uh, beta decay, no, uh, sounds not good. Okay, you see here you don't have Majorana phases. Okay, these are all, all positive numbers. So M beta uh, cannot go to, uh, to zero because even though, for instance, in uh, normal order M1 can be zero, you have these numbers here. And if in inverted order this is zero, you still have positive numbers. So M beta is not zero. Probably you remember from your past the Curie plot for uh, beta decay. Uh, the Curie plot is uh, the plot of uh, uh, what is called Q minus T. The, okay, you will find on the note that in the case of, if you uh, consider, for instance, tritium decay like Catherine, and if you plot uh, this uh, K, this quantity uh, that is actually square root of, uh, Okay, this depends on the square root of the Q value minus the kinetic energy of the electron. This, for massless neutrino, gives you uh, a straight line. Okay, while if the neutrino are massive, and we know that this is true, there is a small deviation in the end of the spectrum, okay? This depends here on the energy of uh, the um, kinetic energy, typically in key EV, of the electron. 
okay? And uh, if you go and measure this part of the spectrum, this is very difficult because you need an extremely accurate energy resolution. Uh, I um, tell you, go and see and look on the web for the catering spectrometer. I don't know if you ever saw this. Is a huge spectrometer, and when they uh, in, during the transportation, when it was going into a street, uh, uh, was impressive. They need uh, need such a, uh, a spectrometer to measure extremely well in the end of the spectrum the electron energy, to be sensitive to the small differences. Okay, this one. I, I made this plot with uh, M nu e 0.5 electron volt. Actually, this is excluded by now, but it was only to show the effect. Okay, two electron volt uh, is uh, also excluded. And uh, so, but through beta decay experiment, Catherine will reach sub EV electron volt sensitivity. Now, M beta is 0.8 electron volt, I believe at 19% confidence level, the measurement of Catherine. So, if you have a bound on M beta, you have a bound on M1 in normal ordering, or M3 in inverted, inverted ordering, if you take into account the two delta M squared coming from oscillations. So, in principle, you can also combine oscillation and non-oscillation result in a one super global analysis, and we miss another ingredient, that is uh, data came, coming from cosmology that are sensitive to the sum of neutrino masses. It, uh, at present, they are not sensitive to, to the, the actual spectrum, okay? Um, both from CMB and large-scale structure measurements, you can uh, put bound on sigma. So, we, what we do? We We have three observables that are sensitive to the spectrum, absolute masses, that are sigma, m beta, and m beta beta. m beta beta actually depends also on Majorana phases, but at present we cannot say anything about Majorana phases, so we marginalize over, so we take all possible values of Majorana phases. And uh, we can, uh, the first thing that we can do is, now, sigma, the sum, let's see, that's right here, the sum, the sigma is actually depending on just one mass, okay? And the other can be reconstructed through the delta M squared with an error, okay? So, um, M1 is also appearing here, and the delta M squared will also appear here. So, these three variables are correlated are not independent, because they depend on oscillation parameters. So the first thing is you consider the information coming only from uh, uh, oscillation parameters. Uh, somewhere. Okay. Here you see three plots. So three planes, sigma and beta beta, this is double beta decay. Up there, sigma and beta, and here m beta, and beta beta. And this is the information coming only from oscillation, 
represented in this plane, uh, the curves are two and three sigma level, okay, of delta k square. Blue is for uh, normal ordering, red for inverted ordering. For instance, here, as we, uh, as I told you, m beta and beta for normal ordering, okay, we are nearly finished, we are finished, goes to zero, can be also zero, while inverted ordering, there is an upper limit, okay, and, and you find it in this group. So here, there is no information still coming from these three experiments, okay, cosmology is a, also a combination of all cos experiments in cosmology, but we will start tomorrow from this, okay. Thank you.